Any rights that we have, from emancipation to decolonization, to women's rights, to franchise, to human rights, these were all fought for by ordinary people. And as Douglas says, they were conceded after struggle. What to the slave is your 4th of July? By now, many of us are familiar with escaped slave Frederick Douglass's famous speech to mostly white abolitionists celebrating their Independence Day. So too, where William Wilberforce's famous hymn, Amazing Grace, is celebrated as a great abolitionist anthem, our next guest is more interested in people whose come to Jesus moment on slavery didn't follow years of involvement in the slave trade. Author and scholar Dr. Priyambara Gopal believes that the stories we tell ourselves about abolition and independence inform the way we understand our struggles today. Who are our heroes? By what means do we make change? And how do we imagine or even think about freedom? Liberty can mean many things, not just, for example, the freedom to earn a meager wage. Dr. Gopal's new book, Insurgent Empire, takes a new look at the history it's just out from Verso Books. to have you. Pleased to be here. So you do start the book with Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. American. Um, why? Why start there? I start there because Douglass's famous insight that power concedes nothing without a struggle, it never did and never will, is I think universalizable. Um, Douglass was making that point in relation to the fight against slavery in the British West Indies. He was also applying it to the fight against slavery in America. And one of the points he was making is that abolition is frequently seen both by black and white people in his time as a white initiative. And he was making the point that in the case of the British West Indies, uh, and he was commemorating the emancipation of slaves when he gave the speech in 1857, his point was that at least a part of the credit must fall to the slaves themselves. And that, he talked about slave yeah, revolts. Yeah, uh, yes, he, he did. And his point in that case was that to the extent that they were able to, and that is in very dangerous, very difficult conditions, slaves fought for their own emancipation and that the, their share of the credit for emancipation must be recognized. And I think that we're still in a situation where we have not recognized the centrality of black and brown people to emancipation. So I mentioned William Wilberforce, he's just one example. Mm -hmm. How is this story normally told or typically told or all too often told? And what were you, are you trying to challenge in the book? Well, certainly in the British context, the story is that both freedom from slavery and decolonization, that is freedom from colonization, came about as a result of white upper class and generally male initiative. Beneficent. Right? Exactly. Bene yeah, exactly. Grant you your freedom. Indeed. So, you know, Wilberforce is a, is a kind of uh, a symbol of that narrative where he's given, he and Clarkson are pretty much given the entirety of the credit for, for emancipation. You've had whole movies about it. Yes, him. exactly. And I'm saying that while we don't need to dismiss their role, the fact is that they were only one of many contributors contributing factors, and that's slave rebellions and the rebellions of the colonized, of black and brown people across the world was utterly central to their own emancipation and to their own decolonization. And I think that's a, that's a fact of the story that's often forgotten. And why is that not just an interesting footnote? Why is that important for us today? I think it is important for us today because I think we still live in a world where we petition power for minor concessions. And we do not see ourselves, when I say we, I mean ordinary people across racial and national lines, we do not see ourselves as agents. Uh, we hope that power will see uh, the better side of things and, and give us some concessions. And my point is that any rights that we have, from emancipation to decolonization to women's rights to franchise to human rights, these were all fought for by ordinary people. And as 
Douglas says, they were conceded after struggle. And I think that that's a point we really need to bring back into our yeah. discussions. The other thing that you raise so powerfully in the book is that our notions of freedom have been different for different people at different times. Indeed. And in the West, they're all wrapped up with ideas of capitalism. Indeed, indeed. But that didn't have to be the case. It doesn't have to be the case. And that's another thing. Um, I think that we live in a world where freedom is very tied to capitalism. It's tied to entrepreneurship. It's tied to consumer choice. It's tied to a limited freedom to sell your wage labor. So I was just reading this morning that somebody just bought uh, a new iPhone, the new iPhone, and he was given a standing ovation for being the first person to buy an iPhone. <laughs> and that, to me, is very significant because I think, well, what is it that we applaud as an achievement? We, achieve, we applaud the freedom, so-called, to buy something, to own something. Whereas, if you look at the struggles of former slaves, uh, and of course slaves themselves, and the uh, colonized, they're asking for very different kinds of things. Like they're, well, they're asking to use land differently. They're talking about, um, you know, you look at the West Indies in the 19th century, and you look at Kenya, East Africa in the 20th century, and in both cases, the freedom for land, that the freedom to ha have land and to use it differently from private ownership and plantation ownership is very, very significant. And there is a sense that land can be used for sustainable living, it can be used for collective living, it can be used for the common good. And, and that's very different from, you know, the, the right to own a piece of land. Buy your uh, iPhone. Yeah, exactly. And buy your iPhone. So there is a different sense of things. In the U.S. context, while the it was also a tradition of co cooperation and collective um, economics that people like Jessica Gordon and Barton and others have written about. At the very simple level of the demand for 40 acres and a mule, it's clear that in the immediately post-Civil War period, um, in that first period of Reconstruction, what the emancipated slaves wanted was the capacity to be self-sufficient. Absolutely. It wasn't to go and Indeed. line up in a factory Indeed. line and get a job. Uh, one of the episodes I write about in the book is the Morant Bay Rebellion in, in 1865. Yes, this you was know. fascinating. Um, and, and again, you see there, they were, uh, they Where had been- Morant Bay? Uh, Morant Bay is in Jamaica. It was one of the most important uh, post-slavery rebellions. There were rebellions after slavery as well against colonial rule or, the, or modes of governance in the colonies. Because remember, white rule doesn't end in, in the West Indies with uh, emancipation. They were emancipated and told, well, now you're free to work for your former owners or for other plantation owners as wage labor. And they saw, in a way that I think was very prescient, the connections between slavery and the ways in which wage labor uh, was was being demanded. They didn't see a huge difference. There in, was a in term, conditions. wage slavery. Wage point. slavery, and indeed, and they saw it in uh, very early on, and they said, well, no, we're, you know, working on plantations as technically free people is not our understanding of freedom. We want a small patch of land. It wasn't um, formulated as 40 acres and a mule. It was, in fact, for, it formulated very modestly. They wanted the unused lands on the edges of the plantations on which to grow crops and have a small homestead and be self sufficient and not to work uh, for anyone else. And, and even that was seen as too much of a mm. demand by, uh, by the British. So let's talk about the colonizer yeah. or the slave culture, the, the hegemonic culture. What about these demands was so threatening, yeah. as if it wasn't obvious? Yeah. Um, and how you say, you know, the colonizers are also affected by this misinterpretation of history. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two ways in which they're affected. And to answer your first question, the demands of the slaves to just have their, the former slaves to have their own land and farm it is described very interestingly in the London Times as a barbaric independence, meaning that they were refusing to be part of capitalism. They were refusing to be part of the mercantile and production network of capitalism. And therefore, the independence that they were demanding was described as barbaric and as unacceptable. And, it, and they're very very explicit in, in discussions of the Morant Bay Rebellion. People back um, in, in Britain are very explicit that this cannot be allowed, that they must be forced into the British mainstream definition of freedom. But there's another line of um, uh, argument in the book, and I think in a way this is even more important. I'm saying that not everybody in Britain was on board with the project of either slavery or empire or colonization. Uh, we have a 
sort of condescending attitude to the past where we look back on the past and we think, well, everybody in the 19th century was racist or everybody in the 19th century was pro-empire. We love, we love binaries. We love binaries and we like to homogenize communities. We like to homogenize the past. And I'm saying that actually that is not the case. There was a minority tradition, but an important minority tradition of dissent uh, against, well, we know about slavery, but also against empire. I'm also saying that not all of the people who were involved in criticizing slavery and empire were like Wilberforce or Clarkson. They were not benevolent patriarchs. They learned from rebellions. They were struck by the fact of bloodshed in the colonies uh, about the fact that Britain was repressing rebellions in their name. And they sought to develop a relationship of what today we would call solidarity with the enslaved and the colonized. So I'm saying that we need to look at these dissenting traditions and as well. And they did it. I mean, there was a wonderful um, essay that you quote that has the title, Smash Our Imperialism. Yes. Of, you know, that they did it in not in a kind of, or the, the people that you're talking about weren't doing somebody else a favor. They understood their own self-interest. Yeah in addressing these questions yes. differently. Yes, absolutely. So one of the uh, recurring themes from the mid 19th century onwards, when you have people like you know, the chartist Ernest Jones responding to the 1857 rebellion in India, and then when you have uh, um, Arthur Ballard from whom this smash our own imperialism quotation comes in the, in the 1930s writing about empire more generally, the argument isn't, well, we need to be nice to the enslaved and the colonized and therefore you know, uh, set them free. The argument is that if we are in involved in enslaving or oppressing or denying other people their freedom, we too remain enslaved and oppressed. And we need to see the connections between oppression overseas and oppression in the country. And what kind, you talked about these two periods, you emphasize a lot, the 1920s, 30s, 40s. What kind of allyship did we see kind of forged in, in these struggles? There are different kinds of allyship. So you, um, in the 19th century, I look at people like Ernest Jones, uh, Wilfred Blunt, a man called Richard Congreve. These are people who are individuals who are writing and lecturing and speaking about the need to develop solidarity across skin colors. So they're very explicitly saying, and this is in the, in the 1850s, uh, you know, do not feel that just because we have white skin, we're immune from oppression and do not think that just because they have black skin, they should be condemned to oppression. So they're asking for alliances across racial lines. They're inviting people, particularly women and the working class, to see connections between their oppression and the oppression of people abroad. Um, so in the 19th century, you have individuals who are trying to make kind of collective dissent and collective alliances. By the time you get to the 20th century post-Russian revolution, you have more explicit uh, attempts to make international and internationalist coalitions against empire, but also uh, ones that are based on a, on, on a critique of capitalism, mm -hmm. very influenced by the Russian Revolution and the emergence of socialism. And gender, what role does gender play in all of this? And was there yeah. a gender analysis as well as everything else? It tends to be very uh, much on the margins, at least in, in, in what I've looked at. I mean, there are women very much involved in some of these movements. Um, we have, uh, in, in the case of the 1930s, we have Amy Ashwood Garvey, who was very involved in the Marcus, inter Garvey's. Marcus Garvey's former wife, who was involved in the International African uh, International Friends of Ethiopia. Um, she was a Pan Africanist. She was very involved in London in organizing demonstrations and uh, you know placards and petitions uh, against the I Italian invasion of uh, Ethiopia. She was involved in uh, organizing the, the Pan African Congress in Manchester. You have a wonderful example in Nancy Cunard, who was a, a British uh uh, aristocrat, though, though not herself wealthy, who absolutely broke from her aristocratic family and threw herself into the cause of uh, black emancipation. And she was very clear that black emancipation could not be bestowed on black people, that black people had to be at the center of world history and at the center of uh, efforts around uh, uh, organizing against uh, imperialism. So, yeah, and Sylvia Pankhurst, the feminist uh, and suffragist.
suffragette who also broke from her uh, mother and sister who were not anti-imperialist uh, or particularly anti-racist. And she becomes in partnership with uh, the American West Indian writer Claude Mackay. She becomes a very passionate anti-imperialist as well. So the women are involved mm -hmm. in this. But gender is, I think, less frequently a topic of discussion than we might like to see. It, it becomes, in a sense, subsumed by race and class. It's all too often that I find myself saying, if only we had listened to X, then this might not have happened. If we had, if people had listened more to about the, what was happening in Ethiopia, maybe the Spanish Civil War wouldn't, you can make this case over and over again. I'm having a, a temptation to say that. Like, if we had only learned from these people, what would be doing? What would we be doing differently now? And I guess I am going to say that. You know, what does? How does this inform this moment, yeah. um, which feels as critical a turning point in Indeed. many ways on these questions of international solidarity, internationalism? Yeah. And yet we are very unfamiliar, even as we commemorate the anniversaries of suffrage and, you know, um, emancipation. We're very unfamiliar with the histories of internationalisms over the years. Yeah. Well, in one sense, you're right that you, you, you look back and you think, well, you know, this has been said. Why is it that we have not learned our lessons? One of the points um, I make is that these are not just marginal traditions, but marginalized traditions. They were very deliberately pushed to the side because the insights that derive from these struggles and these uh, initiatives are very threatening to power. And so there was a need to push them to the side and to treat um, progressive voices as they are treated today as cranks, as people who don't know what they're talking about. We know uh, Yeah, exactly. Well, we've been there. So uh, in one sense, it's not a surprise. In, in a way, it's an honor to have been pushed to the side because it, 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 it tells us how powerful these ideas were. I also like you think, well, you know, some of these insights are desperately relevant for the present. And they're desperately relevant, particularly in terms of the oppositions that were invited to participate in between race and class, for instance, who so were invited to have racial, religious, or national identities and not talk about solidarities, not talk about common ground. Uh, we're invited to uh, say, you know, Britain first, America first, India first, and not talk about the way in which actually people across these countries have more in common or than they to do. Take race versus gender. Yeah, race versus <laughs> gender, race versus sexuality, religion versus sexuality. So with all these kind of false binaries. So I would say that my hope in writing this book is that we can start to bring back some of these very vital lessons that were learned in struggle over the last couple of centuries and bring them back to our own discussions and struggles. We cannot expect to be mainstreamed easily. The mainstream would be very threatened by the ideas, the idea that people can be agents of their own destiny and they do not need power to concede small, uh, you know, throw small crumbs from the master's table. That's how, you know, we are invited to think that we are petitioners who can only buy iPhones and then wait for other things to happen. So, you know, the idea of ordinary people being agents is vital and it needs to be brought back into our struggles. Another side of this picture is the reality of what is happening in India, mm -hmm. which raises a question of former colonized people can become colonizers. We're mm -hmm. looking at the treatment of Kashmir. We also see that in Israel with the treatment of Palestine. Mm -hmm. How do you address that or think about those um, questions? The important thing about colonization, and I think there's a realization in, 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 in a lot of the struggles and the figures that I look at as well, and colonization isn't just about one particular race oppressing another race. Colonization is a dynamic of oppression. It's a dynamic of exploitation, of land grabbing, of uh, oppressing people, of creating racial hierarchies. And it can be practiced across contexts. So we can it's, all do it. We, yeah, we can all do it. We, and we are all in one way or the other shaped by uh, colonization. And we have a relationship to colonization that we should be thinking about. So um, one of the more tragic consequences of decolonization is what uh, we might call arrested decolonization, which is to say that in contexts which decolonized with a great deal of hope and optimism and passion, decolonization 
ultimately resulted in a measure of independence from white rule, from British rule or uh, French rule, but it did, as indeed people like Aimé Césaire and Frantz Fanon, the great anti-colonialists, predicted, they often resulted in the takeover of the colonial apparatus by black and brown elites. Mm -hmm. And this warning, I'm afraid, is a tragedy that came to be true, that in, in, in a place like India, for instance, uh, we very much have a dynamic of colonialism that is directed inwards towards different constituencies in India and directed towards peoples who were never quite unambiguously part of the Indian nation state. And this relationship between the post-colonial nation and colonial dynamics I think is something we have to grapple with in a very clear-sighted fashion because colonialism per se has not gone away. We're, we're not living in a decolonized world. So are we grappling? I think some of us are grappling. I am, you know, I do think we should pay honor to uh, both the struggles in Palestine and the struggles of the Kashmiri people and what we can learn from them today. Uh, we should acknowledge that many of us are trying in many ways to be allies to these struggles, to learn from these struggles, to uh, think about ourselves as, uh, uh, as indeed the British dissidents that I talk about uh, saw themselves in relation to the empire, that a lot of us also think of ourselves as wanting to do something in partnership rather than in a condescending, benevolent way. But this is a very difficult lesson to learn. And I find myself grappling with what does it mean for me as an upper caste Hindu woman who belongs to the majority in the Indian state to be an ally with people who are struggling for the same things Indians were struggling for 70 years ago. And there's a real poignancy to that. You mentioned the fact, you know, the reality that there have been many empires, French as well as British, and yet there is something speci special or, or distinct about the British Empire in its significance. Um, I don't think that's just because I grew up there and my father was British. It's historically connected with this exercise, this experiment of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit, talk a little bit about why this merits so much attention? Because a lot of people look at Britain now and say, ah, it's over, who cares? Yeah. Let's move on there and such chaos, Brexit, yeah, yeah. karma, whatever. Yeah. That chaos <laughs> is not unconnected to uh, to empire. It, it is on the one hand karma, but on the other hand, it's also a failure to have decolonized itself. Britain has failed to decolonize. It hasn't come to terms with what happened and, and, and what uh, it, the consequences uh, of empire were and decolonization were for it. So it is karma, but it is also a tragedy in its own right. Right. Um, the British Empire was the largest, so it, you know, at its height, it it, it ran two fifths of the globe, uh, and there were other places which it didn't rule formally, like uh, Palestine, uh, where it was a, ma you know, where it ran a mandate. So it is the largest. Um, Britain is not unique in being a capitalist empire. All the European empires—the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, Dutch, German, and uh, British—were part of capitalism, but because Britain is so large and so consequential, uh, I think we have to think about the ways in which modern capitalism, the economic system in which we live and the social systems that it gave rise to are very tied up to the British Empire and the French Empire, which comes a, a, a close second. And uh, there's a tendency in Britain to say, uh, stop whining about it, it was all back in the day. Right. But actually, that's simply not the case, that, the, that the, the world in which we live in today in Britain and outside is shaped by the British Empire and capitalism is very tied up to the project of empire. Fra slavery and colonization were all about, uh, you know, the, be the beginnings and the emergence and the consolidation of capitalism. So it's a bit of a, a historical mistake to see the age of empire as over. You only and have to look at Ireland. To you only that. have to look at Ireland, and that's coming back in a, in a big way. That you know, the fact of partition, partition in Kashmir has, is, has lethal consequences. And today, the partition of Ireland uh, is going to have very serious consequences as well. So to close in our last couple of minutes with the US, um, I'm curious to think, we often say in this, we have to end this program by saying, you know, how do you think the future will tell the story of right now? Um, and right now, we're seeing some fairly significant enterprise, you know, in, in innovations or, or um, well, you know, Interventions is the word I'm searching for, like the 1619 Project of the New York Times. It's at the New York Times, special section on how, in fact, American history 
is the history of slavery, how much of our economy, culture, way of life is embedded in its roots as a slave society. Great. Um, a beginning. Mm -hmm. What do you think we need to go next? And, and how does this change us? And I know you probably weren't here when this got released, but were you impressed by the 1619 project? I think it's like some of the initiatives in Britain. My own university, Cambridge, is now uh, undertaking a project to look at uh, you know, how it, it benefited from slavery. I think these are all good starts, and there's no point in dismissing them. They're, it's better than the denial and silences that we've lived with. But I think that they must always be pushed to be more than they are. Um, and I think that including slavery or thinking thinking about slavery or thinking about empire is fine, as long as it is not pushed or kept as on one side, right? As to say, well, there was also slavery. One of the points that the great uh, American scholar Robin Kelly makes is that we need to think about the ways in which black and brown people were at the center of world history. And back in the day, W.E.B. Du Bois made a point about America. He said that it's not just that you know, slavery happened, it's that the labor and the efforts of black people, including black women, are at the center of American life, that American democracy owes something yes. to black Americans, to African Americans, and that it is very fundamentally reliant on them. Modernity today is fundamentally part of the efforts of black people, both in terms of their labor and of their resistance to slavery and empire. And I think that centrality must be acknowledged. Uh, and, and if we can get to that point, then that's all to the better. And they might be owed more than just a special section in the New York Times Indeed. Magazine. Indeed. Dr. Priyam Vadagopal is the author of a new book, Insurgent Empire, that you can find at your local independent bookseller. It's out from Verso. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you.